I don't make every decision at Twitch, but I'm responsible for every decision. 99.9% of tech CEOs aren't going to do this. Because their lives depend upon the decisions I make. I am just in a room with Dan. There's no PR person here. If I were CEO of Amazon, I think it'd be stupid for me to do this. I think that's why you're so good at what you do now. So people ask me, well, tell me how to succeed. What's your secret? I said, well, first become CEO of Twitch. How do I do discovery on Twitch? How do I grow? The best way to grow on Twitch is... Dan Clancy is CEO of Twitch. He plays dodgeball with Ludwig, met with streamers one-on-one while traveling the country, living out of his van, and went viral singing country roads on his own stream. Dan cares about the community, and he needs to make Twitch profitable, and has made hard decisions like layoffs, exiting Korea, and changing how streamers are paid. Today in the Carrot Podcast, Dan shares his plan to save Twitch, how Twitch has become so culturally valuable, and why he himself started streaming. Three, two, one. There we go. That was powerful. There you go. Audio synced. I love it. Dan, thanks so much for joining us out today in White Salmon, Washington. Mm -hmm. Last time I saw you, you were singing your heart out at Cutie's Christmas concert as a Grand Theft Auto role-playing character. I was. I was. And you were really damn good. Well, thank you. I think the entire audience had a moment where about 15 seconds into the song, they said, that is the CEO of Twitch. (laughs) And I only recognized you, I confess, because I had seen a couple weeks before you pelting dodgeballs at Will Neff in like a high school gymnasium. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Down there a couple of (laughs) times. So to me, this like completely broke my image of a CEO. So I used to work at Instagram. All right. And actually I helped build Instagram live. Okay. I, every time, wanted to try and connect with creators. It'd be like, no, you got to talk to product marketing, to research, to community, to the point where eventually I just go to these conferences on my own dime just to hang out with the people. But I see so few people do this. So I have to ask you, how did this get started? The desire to, I guess, hey, I'll just go and hang with people in real life. Well, the funny thing was when I started at Twitch, because I started four and a half years ago, I started, I was running product and engineering, and I I started in August, and then we had TwitchCon in, um, uh, it was October down in San Diego. And um, I was all excited to meet all these streamers. I was like, great, this is super, I'm looking forward to meeting them. And I went to the the team that managed all the relationships, and they go, oh, um, I I was like, what do you have planned for me, right? Because basically it was me, you know, I was one of the three main people running the company. And they were like, oh, um, they're real busy. I, we don't really have anything planned. It's not, they don't necessarily want to talk to you. And it's funny, I, I hung out in this, what we call the Purple Partner Lounge for our bigger, right. bigger partners. And I would just go up and introduce myself to them. And, um, but it really, I mean, even in, even bef- you know, um, for my, most of my years at Twitch, um, there was still a similar type of hesitancy, right? right. And, um, uh, and kind of, well, let's just manage it and control it. And when I became CEO, one thing I started doing was streaming regularly. And um, I'm sure we'll talk about that some more. And I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I've been spending a lot of time going out and spending time with streamers. And as I spend time with them, I just spend time with them like as people, right? Yeah. And just hang out with them. So like the dodgeball thing, Ludwig just called me up and asked me to do it. And so he just did it as a fun thing, not as, you know, anything else. And same thing with QT. But I I love that, right? You're not at the dodgeball tournament saying, hey, guys, I'm Dan Clancy, CEO of Twitch. I'd like to talk to you about our latest feature. You're just throwing balls. And I went and watched the YouTube replays later. And people are like, this guy took out the entire (laughs) hit team by himself. Like, who is this? And someone commented, well, did you know Dan Clancy used to be a professional baseball player? No, that's not true. I know that's not true. That is not true. I Googled it. You've coached baseball. (laughs) I have coached baseball. But like, there are stories now spinning about you in a way as a creator. I remember, congratulations, by the way, on making the Twitch partnership. There you level. go. Yep, yep, yep. But you, at one point, you were rejected. I was rejected. I was rejected. I, I, um, I had been streaming, and I purposely didn't tell anyone I was going to apply because I just wanted to see what happened. And of course, a lot of people apply and get rejected. And as I did it, I knew I didn't because I, I know what the internal requirements are. Right. Okay, and I knew I didn't quite meet them. I knew I was close, but I wasn't mm-hmm. quite there. Okay, and when I did it, there was one of three things that could happen. Um, 
uh, either they could reject me, which would be fun. Uh, number two, I thought maybe they will realize that I'm applying and wait and give it to me on stage at TwitchCon as a surprise. Of course, but I couldn't suggest that because, oh, that would be very right. funny because they often partner people on stage at TwitchCon. Yeah, it's a big deal. Right? And so I thought that would be a fun thing to do at TwitchCon. Or number three is they could just give it to me. And the third one would be the one boring outcome. And luckily, that isn't that. what happened. Yeah. Well, they ended up going with option one. Option one, one, which was not, play. it was just, they just looked at it. Whoever rejected it had no idea it was me. And they just looked at the numbers and they rejected me. So. But, okay. So, Dan, can you imagine being this Twitch employee? <laughs> <laughs> I know. You find out this DJ Clancy figure who goes and applies, and you're like, "Who is this dude? He doesn't qualify he doesn't rejection." Have the numbers, and you find out a few weeks later, "Oh, that that's the CEO." Yeah, what what a surreal moment. Well, this, then I, then I applied a um, again. Yeah, and this time they all knew, and of so course. and and by this time actually my numbers were good enough. Yeah. that I was, uh, you know, I would get it even if they didn't know. Well, you also had viral moments. There's one of you singing country road mm -hmm. that has millions of views. And I kind of love this concept. Like you didn't tell people at Twitch, this was going to be a thing. You were just like, I'm going to go out and meet people and stream. Um, part of the magic of Twitch sometimes is these smaller communities. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of people, you know, know the big streamers like Hassan or someone like that. But a lot of the magic is someone with 200, 300 um, um, average viewers at any given time. And it was nice because, you know, when I really started streaming regularly, I started out and I had 25 and then I had 50 and then I had 70. And now I'll usually be at 300, 400, maybe 500. Same. And it I, it I get that experience of a smaller, more close-knit community. So How did really you fun. grow your concurrent viewers? Well, that's the thing. The one thing, in it, and I say this many uh, frequently when, you know, people talk about the partnership application is um, uh, which in one, on one level, it's fun that, you know, we kind of joke about it and all. Um, on another level, the reality is I didn't have to work as hard mm. as all the streamers. It is the fact that I'm CEO. So people ask me, well, tell me how What's to succeed. What's your secret? I said, well, first become CEO of Twitch. Then after you do that. Um, and so it is the fact that um, it's much easier for me, right? Because I, I already have some draw the fact that I'm the CEO of Twitch and a lot of people collaborate with me. So it's a lot easier for me. What I also really like, so I watched a couple interviews that the current CEO of YouTube, Neil Mohan did with Colin and Samir, yep. as well as one Ludwig did with Susan, the no, previous yeah, CEO yeah, of yes. YouTube. And both of them said something I thought was really interesting. Neil said, when Colin and Samir asked him like, what are you building next? How are you addressing the fact that monetization on short form is really hard? He said, you know, you guys are the creators. You get it. We're not creators. We're not creatives. We're just building tools for you. Susan echoed that in her conversation with Ludwig. She said, look, you know, I don't think necessarily the more you watch YouTube, the better you are going to be at running YouTube. I strongly disagree with that. When I was at Instagram, a lot of the product managers I worked with never even talked to the creators they were working with. Yeah. Not only that, we've talked a lot about you streaming, about you doing dodgeball, you doing concerts. You lived out of a van for over a month, visiting over 15 cities where you just hung out with streamers. Yeah. I think that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. What I want to understand better is 99.9% .9 of tech CEOs aren't going to do this. Where did this come from? <laughs> Well, the interesting thing is, first of all, I do think Twitch is different, although I agree with you, um, uh, with your comment even with YouTube um, or Instagram. But I want to distinguish two things. First of all, there's one is which is hanging out with the creators. Mm. It's another thing which is viewing. Those are not the same thing, okay? Because obviously there are millions and millions of viewers, mm -hmm. okay? But there are small, a far smaller number of creators, and the foundation of Twitch and all user-generated content are the creators. So I do think it's hugely valuable for me yeah. to have a sense for the creators. And I think Twitch even more so than the other platform because Twitch, Twitch is a community platform, of mm. course. And, and um, uh, they create communities, but the, the community is very tight around Twitch. And so I think it's even more important for Twitch. And um, you know, going to your question about the trip, I was already planning on... Um, uh, going to a music festival in Nashville. Yeah. And um, I had already been 
whenever I would go to a town, I'd make a point to meet with the creators and the streamers in the town. So I had been to Austin a few times. I'd been to LA whenever I'd go on a normal trip, but I didn't go on trips in the Southeast. Mm. And so I was like, there are all sorts of, you know, streamers I'm not meeting. And um, so I came up with the idea because, so I have a sprinter band myself and I spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, now in this particular case, I thought about bringing my sprinter van down, but decided it was going to take too long to get it there. So I rented one and I toured around basically the Southeast and made a big loop um, and stopped. And in each city I'd meet with streamers, sometimes with bigger streamers, sometimes with just yeah. affiliates that we would have like a meetup at a local restaurant. And you're just li you're living out of your van. Most of the time, I'm living. I mean, there's a romanticism to it to say I'm fully living like, out of my van. Yeah, Jack Kerouac, like on the yes, road. And, yeah. and, and I could play up that romanticism. The reality is, when I'm in the middle of Atlanta, I'm not living out of my van. There's no place I can park my van. Um, it's hot. There is an air Sticky. conditioned van, but I need to plug it in if I'm going to run it. And I can't just park it on a random street in Atlanta. So, like when I'm in Atlanta or I'm in a big city, then I would end up staying at a hotel. Yeah, I, I like to think though, in another world, it could be Dan in the van living out of it, singing, oh. doing oh. music. Well, no, oh, no, I, I brought my piano on the trip and I rigged it up so I streamed throughout the trip and I had my piano. So wow. I lugged my, uh, uh, obviously a portable piano, but I, I lugged it out there. I set it up with cameras and, and Wi-Fi and all that. So that way um, I would do it. In fact, I did one stream in Miami with another streamer that we just did an impromptu where we were singing Stand together out. and playing the piano. Yeah. I remember that when you were initially announced as CEO, the reporters did their usual thing and went to streamers and says, what, what do you think of Dan Clancy? And I remember one streamer, I think it's a Jake, Jake and Bake. Bake. Yeah. Jake and Bake, yeah. Infamous line says, yeah. uh, you know, I don't, I don't think the guy gets it. Yeah. And you were a self-professed, hey, I don't game, even though you were creative, even though we were artistic. But now, Miss Kiff, months later, tweeted, Dan Clancy is the best thing that has happened to Twitch. And yeah. this has been in the span of like X months because you've actually gone out and invested the time. My question now is, You've gone and built these relationships, something you've always been good at. How do you reconcile, hey, how do I support the streamers and the creative side with Twitch is a subsidiary of Amazon? I just read the Everything Store over the plane on the ride here about Bezos's extreme focus on growth and profitability. The infrastructure to support Twitch, as we all know, actually a lot of people don't realize, extremely expensive. Yep. How do you wrestle with that? Wrestling with it is the foundation of making sure Twitch is a sustainable business in here for the long term. Mm. Because as you think of it, and, and I am very aware, this, this was, I mean, it became very clear to me as I went around and met with streamers that, um, uh, you know, many of these people, if we take Coke Carnage as an example, yes. he's, Millionaire. I don't know exactly how old, but somewhere upper thirties, 40, he's got three kids or something like that. And he'll be streaming for the next 20 years, yeah. right? If Twitch isn't around, the reality is people often say, oh, well, there are all these streaming platforms. They're not like Twitch. YouTube Live is not like Twitch. TikTok is not like Twitch. His life would be incredibly different if Twitch wasn't here. And so, in fact, we have a responsibility mm. of making sure Twitch is here 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 now. Because while maybe Co stops streaming 30 years from now, there'll be someone who's starting today that will still be streaming. And there isn't a plan B because they they stepped off the the path that they were going before. So many were like, um, oh, I was an IT professional. Oh, I was working in finance. Oh, I was like, I got my degree in, you know, microbiology and then I became a creator. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they go and create for 10, 15 years and then they don't go back and say, oh, let me get that IT professional job. It's too late. It's, it, it, they chose a path. And yeah. so I think the responsibility of making sure that Twitch is sustainable is a responsibility to the creators. It's also a responsibility to Amazon. Yeah. But um, uh, first and foremost, it's a responsibility to the creators. Twitch is a cultural phenomenon. And it's given millions of people a way to be creative and make a living. Yeah. If you have a responsibility to them, it's to ensure that it continues existing. Yep. I know also in trying to balance the two, even as co-founder of Carrot, many times we make decisions that actually long-term are good for creators in the business, 
but they don't perceive it that way. <laughs> That's where, frankly, the personal relationships I've built really matter. Because mm -hmm. even if they're like, this seems to make no sense, they know they can text me and clarify and understand. I know you've done the same. You've yep. given your personal number out to member streamers. One thing you've done in the past few months that I greatly admire, you've announced changes at Twitch. For example, hey, there's now rules initially on having sponsorships mentioned in stream. Or we're going to change the not safe for work standards on Twitch, where there's tons of hullabaloo, tons of pushback. And you openly went back and said, hey, after hearing what the community said, we're going to change it. Yep. Companies don't usually do that. Yeah. And I want to clarify in terms of with both those things. Yeah. Um, uh, but let's use the most recently. Sometimes it is how people respond to it. So for example, yeah. um, there are many artists who wanted to use the human body as part of their expression. Yes. And they had been asking this for years. And we said, oh, we can do that. You just have to label it. However, then many people started using the human body and it dominated the art category. Right. And we just didn't have the systems in place mm. to build the right experience. Now, over time, we're working on improving the systems where we can blur thumbnails, where we can allow people to create settings and say, I don't wanna see stuff like this. So it may be something that we can reevaluate, but the, the reality is Twitch is a very complex ecosystem. Yes. And uh, how the community and the creators respond, you don't always know. And in this case, you know, we got a very clear signal and so, you know, it was, I think it, it actually was a fairly easy decision. What I especially appreciate about how unique of a company Twitch is, mm -hmm. one, to try and change these standards, because as you said, there is a certain element of artistry where you want people to be free to express what they want. You see this responsibility to let people show what they want. So it starts off as saying, hey, you want to show the human body, go for it. Tons of implications because Twitch is also a business. Yep. This sort of balance between the two, I think it comes down to what you said initially. Twitch is about community. The same sorts of relationships you focused on in your creative or artistic work too. When you have a community, I actually don't think of Twitch as a platform the same way I think of Instagram or TikTok because I see those much more focused on discovery and algorithms. Mm-hmm. I see Twitch as if you really want to engage with somebody, this is where you come. In a weird way, and a friend quoted this to me, Twitch is not really competing with TikTok. Twitch is competing more with like Patreon or even OnlyFans. Or actually, I would say, interestingly, we, 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 I think we are unique in the space. Mm. So first of all, we talk about social networking. Okay. However, um, sitting on your phone swiping is not particularly social, Right. As human beings, we yearn to engage with other people and we evolve to do that what I'll call synchronously. Mm. When we're both engaging, community doesn't come from just posting something and reading something five hours later, right? Community comes from us having a conversation and not just one conversation, mm -hmm. okay? I've, I've often said um, all of your deep, meaningful friendships started out as light, shallow interactions. Wow. If you think about it, every single one of yours started out as a light, shallow interaction, and then you had a lot of light, shallow interactions condensed over a period of time. Yeah. And eventually the light, shallow interactions became a deep, meaningful friendship. Yeah. Right? And um, uh, that's what happens on Twitch, okay? Because people are there at the same time. They are engaged in a community. It's not just about the streamer to the viewer. It's also viewer to viewer. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, uh, it's in some ways, it's a long form viewing mm -hmm. like Amazon Prime Video or Netflix or something like that, but it is social and community based. So I really think it's, it's unique and right. it's different than live streaming on TikTok. Yes. Because live streaming on TikTok, the people don't recognize each other. That's not a community. It's a bunch of people yelling. Yeah. Same thing on YouTube. And that's why I say Twitch is unique in that. And I, I, I use the phrase community-centric live streaming. Mm. Two, three thoughts. The first one is, you know, I was actually wrong in the comparison to OnlyFans mm. and Patreon because they lack the synchronous, yes, shallow developing to deepening relationships, you said. Number two, TikTok live streaming, you literally have people who've blown up making NPC streams that are so depersonalized. They're just fungible units of yes. content. The algorithm is serving to you. Now, a lot of people have talked about, well, how do I do discovery on Twitch? How do I grow? And yet it's precisely weirdly because there isn't that algorithm that when you have someone watching you, they actually really, really care. Yes. This goes to my third point. And my question for you, 
So in a world where so much of everybody, especially from a tech POV, everyone's talking about short form. That's how you get found. That's what's blowing up. You are, as you said, focused on meaningful long form engagement. There's almost a path you take where number one is you try and compete upper funnel and you say, you know what? We'll also help with distribution. Yep. The second is, no, we are going to double down on what we're really good at. Which of those two do you think about? I think it's, I think it's an easy question. It's mm. the focus on what you're good at. I think the mistake that many companies make is they mistakenly think that people want an everything app. Mm. They want to go to one place where they can get all their needs met. We don't want that, okay? We want to go to the best place for each of our needs and our different needs, and all the needs aren't the same, okay? And so um, we provide a different value proposition, mm -hmm. I think. And the reality is if we tried to be TikTok, we wouldn't be as good as TikTok. We'd be mm -hmm. a bad TikTok. Mm -hmm. And the reality is TikTok or YouTube is a bad Twitch, okay? Because their site is optimized for those light, shallow interactions. Yeah. Okay. And our site is optimized. You, you alluded to it. Um, the very thing that makes Twitch work is that we keep you on the creator's channel page. Mm. Okay. And since we keep you there, you pull up a chair and you sit for an hour. Yeah. And when you sit with someone for an hour, you start building an emotional connection to them. Right. And so in fact, the, the creators aren't actually the star of TikTok. The platform is the star. They're cogs in a content They're cogs. machine. Yes, and and the emotional connection. Suppose think of uh, think of everyone you see in TikTok. Yeah. Now suppose suddenly one of them stopped creating videos for a month. Would you even notice it? It's hard, right? You might be like, oh wait, maybe I haven't seen a video. If someone stops streaming on Twitch, people that watch that streamer know within twenty four hours. Like what's going on? Hold on, they're always here on Monday. Where are they? Yeah. Are okay. They okay. Yeah, what's happening? Why are they stopping? And that is because they build a connection, but the connection comes from spending time with that creator. And so that doesn't work as well for discovery, but that's okay. Mm. Our, our streamers are creators, right? We aren't the only platform out there for discovery, okay? Most of our streamers create short form content too. And this idea that it all has to be on our platform is a fundamentally flawed idea. It's also a kind of, egocentric, narcissistic view that, oh, it's my company. I want everything to happen on my platform. It's like, no, figure out what you're good at and place yourself within the broader ecosystem. And so the recent decision to allow simulcasting on different platforms, is it a similar vein where it's, look, the community we have on Twitch is special important. If doing so on whatever platforms helps you get distribution, great, because we're confident that what we have is special. Yes. I feel like the, the prohibition against that, some of the policies around exclusivity, um, it's, it's not unusual, but you know, there's this sense of fear. Oh, if we let that, what will happen? And I think fear ends up limiting us as a platform. And that in fact, if you're confident in what you're doing as a platform, and I am confident in where we fit, that I don't have to be fearful of having them simulcast on other platforms. Yeah. The decisions you're making, I mean, Again, just for folks viewing, like I am just in a room with Dan. There's no PR person here. He is, <laughs> he's wearing jogging shorts. It almost comes from a place of confidence, not from a place of fear. Right. To your point, not only how you're leading Twitch's direction today. Hey, we know we are so important culturally and focused on community. We will make decisions to support that rather than trying to win you over with contracts or exclusivity or playing in other parts of the funnel, but also you as a person Hey guys, I'm just going to go and hang out with Hassan and be a human being. Right. <laughs> That's what which is about in a way. I'm so curious, your own decision making as Dan, has that always been something, even when you were in college or earlier, confidence driven versus fear driven? Um, I, I think... All of us balance between the two things. Mm. That's that's the dichotomy of being a human being, right? You yeah. know, um, uh, I think as humans, we are built to like stability, mm -hmm. right? We we like like the things that we're comfortable with, okay? Um, uh, but we also then yearn for something more, and that is the foundation of what led humanity to explore. Okay, but it also keeps us in a certain place where you're with people that you like and you're happy. And so 
I'm always very conscious that that's a dichotomy that exists in all of us. Yeah. And that in general, um, uh, I always encourage people as they, and it relates to your jump, right? Um, your jump is something that it's like, what do you mean? You're making good money at Instagram, right? Right. You know, you're going to leave being this to do this other thing. What are you thinking? And the reality is when you make a jump to something new, that's when you learn and it's uncomfortable. But one phrase that I often say is you should embrace being uncomfortable mm. because um, in terms of growth, in fact, I'm reading this book by Adam Grant. I just finished it, Hidden Potential, mm -hmm. which talks a lot about this because I think the foundation of us finding all the potential that lies within us is challenging ourselves and being uncomfortable. I love that. And actually ties back to your previous point on relationships. The reason why I made that jump, I think as human beings, we're social creatures mimicking each other. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do something different. That's why I moved to Silicon Valley. And it's because I was trying to buy so many friends who had made these jumps that it became, well, maybe I can do that too. Yep. For yourself, what are those moments in your life you look back on as this was a moment of experiencing discomfort? This was a jump, a leap that I took. Certainly when I, I mean, at each of my big transitions, I, I left NASA and I was, you know, managing seven or 800 people. I was an executive there. I was, you know, if I wanted to stay there, I could have been center director. I was doing well. And I went to Google and I was managing 25 engineers all reporting to me. Wow. Right. And I hadn't been coding in five years. And so, you know, that sense. And in Google, you don't write code, you know, come on. Who are you if you don't write yeah, code? I like was an even engineering the product leader. managers are expected to be technical. If you can't code, what's your value? And I was technical, but I had mm. to earn my stripes because they realized eventually that I was very technical, even though I, I mean, didn't. You did AI at NASA. You helped right. on the Mars mission. <laughs> so I didn't have my hands on the keyboard, but it was different. And then when I left NASA, I frequently I said this when I was leaving NASA, I felt like I was blessed to be um, uh, living in um, Rome during the Renaissance, right? And not only that, but being able to work on the Sistine Chapel, being working at Google, because wow. Google's this amazing place. But of course, a lot happened during the Renaissance. Right. And um, uh, I decided I didn't want my career to just be I went to Google. I stayed at Google. And that was the big thing that said, no, let me go do. And I went to next door, which I learned so much from doing that. Mm. And then I left there and then I learned so much from being at Twitch. So I will say throughout my career, I've often said I usually stay in a role two years longer than I should have. What do you mean by that? I also like the relation as I, the foundation for me is relationships. Yeah. I like the people I'm working with. And so I have a resistance to leaving. There's that loyalty. Cause I build those bonds. And so that loyalty usually keeps me where the last two years, I'm not growing as much, developing as much challenging. Mm. And so when I look both when I got my PhD at NASA, at Google, and even at next door, Pretty much every stop, I think I stayed two years too long. And when you think back to the relationships you've built, so at least when I think about my life, many of my big decisions going from college into investment banking consulting, mm -hmm. leaving that to join Instagram, leaving that to do Carrot, even the decision at Carrot to start creating content, it was prompted by friends who were doing the same things that I started to emulate and eventually follow and then be teammates with them at the same time. For yourself, when you think about the big moments of your life, what are the key relationships that you built that changed the way you think? It's interesting. There's there obviously are a ton of relationships yeah. with folks at Google. It just the, the list, if I, if I list one, I have to list 20 because there wasn't any singular. Um, some people have like that one person that right. like guides them. A group, a team. And, and I've always had, and sometimes I've been in roles where, you know, I was working for someone that, wasn't the one that was guiding me. I had to right. guide myself. And so the way I think of it is um, uh, we all need to be our own best coach. Mm. And that there may be people at different times that can advise us, but in the end, we're the ones that have to coach ourselves. There's almost this point on, yes, operate ideally from confidence, not fear, knowing it's a mix of those. Relationships matter, but also, hey, we take responsibilities for ourselves. And... We ultimately, I think this goes to your framing. I stayed two years longer than I should have. Yep. That should implying I had a responsibility for my own growth that 
I ended up deprioritizing a bit because of the relationship piece as well. Which isn't yeah. a bad thing, by the way, because yeah. I enjoyed those and those relationships matter to me. It's more an observation about that growth, but it wasn't necessarily, I wasn't unhappy in those two years. It's the interesting twist. I was very happy. The reason why I'm asking more about you personally, it's really because I think you've brought so much of Dan Clancy, TJ Clancy, to your role as CEO. So one of the hardest things I found in Carrot, many of my closest friends are now our clients. Like I work with people who are my friends and I become friends with people that I work. And on the one hand, it's a beautiful, wondrous thing where mm -hmm. it is this positive feedback cycle where we launch something and I go and play pickleball with a streamer friend. Like Alex Botez is a great friend of mine. I'll get sushi yeah. with her. I'll be like, what, what do you think of this? And she'll, she'll just tell me, I'll just text her. Right. But sometimes it's hard <laughs> because we'll serve clients and we make mistakes all the time. We tried out this service where the quality wasn't where I wanted it. And then I have creators coming to me and basically saying, Eric, what the f it, it hurts a lot to take that personal sting to the point where a lot of times I will go back to my team and it's almost, um, again, I read in the everything store, Jeff Bezos gets an email from a customer saying this didn't go well. And apparently he just forwards it with a question mark <laughs> and it becomes like, everyone go fix this. It's very right. like, go do it. I end up doing that a lot. How do you handle the sort of, you get to build a relationship, but with the responsibility, with the relationship comes to an obligation or responsibility too, that could affect your decision and maybe that decision for the company for twitch to exist is different than what this one person needs yeah so um i mean i think you touched on a few things um one thing you touched on one, one of my favorite books is this book unbearable lightness of being by milan kundera and that book is about again the dichotomy of weight and and um responsibility with lightness and joy and of course um in the role as a you know ceo and as leading a company um, there's a great deal of joy and there's a great deal of weight. Um, as I've often said, um, I don't make every decision at Twitch, but at some level I'm responsible for every decision. Yes. And I feel that responsibility, okay? In the end, that's what the creators care about. Mm. Because in fact, suppose I didn't feel that weight, right? Then I think they would be concerned, right? Because I should feel weight in my role because their lives depend upon the decisions I make. And so at some level, the fact that I feel that weight is I think one reason why I can have such good, you know, relationships with them because they sense that I care about it and I feel that weight. That care, I think is the most important thing. There's a quote, I believe it's from Maya Angelou. Hey, people don't remember what you said. They remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And in a way mm -hmm. that's community is almost like feelings at mass. That's what brand is. How do I think, does Twitch care about me? Yeah. When I used to work at Meta, we had this metric called Cal. It literally stood for cares about you. And the reason why at Meta was we shipped a lot of things. It was very move fast, build things, break things, yep. ship, and metrics would change. We'd worry that we got 10% more growth at the expense of 10% people hating us more. So we developed this metric cares about you as a way to assess goodwill. But you know what's so funny, Dan? It became its own unit yeah. that was gold on this metric, which develops I call the carbon offsets method of kindness. Well, you know, sure, I polluted over here, but it's okay because I planted five trees over there. Yeah. This change pissed everyone off, but I shipped a New Year's Day greeting card experience that made people happy. So it cares about you nets out to being even. Right. How do you measure that trust at Twitch? Good numbers are really powerful. Mm. Bad numbers are really dangerous. And that, in fact, um, uh, being someone who comes from a very numerical background, yeah. it's easy. It's, and in fact, this is one thing I've said at Twitch frequently, which people are like, oh, I'm glad somebody is saying that. I'm saying... The, life isn't about numbers, okay? Some numbers are really good. Some things cannot be measured great. And sometimes you create a BS number that makes you feel like you can measure it, but you're not really measuring it, okay? And so those things that can't be, and in fact, then you try to add two numbers that are different currencies, right? Because you try to, like this one good metric and you try to balance and you're just making up. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I usually push against those made up numbers when there isn't a good number. And humans have to apply judgment. 
Yeah. And so you can't metricize everything. Sometimes as human beings, we apply judgment and make judgment calls. So this focus on, hey, metrics mm. are but an imperfect metric, an imperfect measure of what we actually care about. Is this something, as you said, you've been very quantitative roles at Google, on Google Books, technology product, and NASA on AI. Is that a theory that's been long held or something that's developed over time and newer? It's probably developed over time because, of course, yeah. Silicon Valley is obsessed with, with metrics. Driven. And um, especially management is always obsessed with metrics because they feel like, well, that's the only way I'm going to manage this company is I set a metric and I tell yeah. you to hit this metric and that's how you do management. Um, and again, in some cases it works great and in other cases it works exceptionally poorly. And so it's probably something that is my confidence in saying that has had to develop over time mm. because there's so much meme that just leans towards, give me a number, give me a number, give me a number. I like that too, because I have many streamer and creator friends who are burned out, even myself. The analytics apps, I have YouTube Studio as the number one most viewed app on my phone because every day I wake up and I look, how do the latest podcast and video yep. do? And it's so immediate. You're like, do people like it? And it becomes very hard to remember, I didn't do this to be get a million followers. I did this because I want to have real conversations with people I liked and share that with other people. And sometimes... Those two aren't aligned. Sometimes I might have an amazing conversation and people are just going to watch it for whatever reason. And I have to remind myself of that. I know on Twitch, how have you thought about trying to build that ethos you just described into there are metric streamers care about on concurrence and number of subscribers and number of viewers? So you highlight this thing that, in fact, I think one of the biggest challenges is this uh, for a creator is this using numbers to be evaluative of whether or not it did a good job. And I think that's a challenge at Twitch. Um, uh, you know, ACCV, the average concurrent viewers, people, I, and I do this myself. I do a stream. I get an email with my stream summary. I go and say, oh, what was my ACCV? Yeah. And if it's high, then I feel like, oh, I did a good stream. And if it's low, then I feel like, oh, okay, oh, well, I thought it was a good stream. And my brain knows that that's, BS, yeah. but my body still responds that way. Okay. Now I do personally, I have been thinking a lot about, but it, it's one of these things that you can't change metrics easily. I think there are other metrics we can find besides ACCV. That's a mm -hmm. better metric of, did you do a good job? But at some level managing this dichotomy, these are the choices and the things that individual streamers need to do. Mm. I think we do need to be careful if in some way, hacking the streamer. So I'll use an example. Um, a phrase that has often been used is, oh, well, you should gamify mm. the creator experience, right? Because we're a gaming platform. Yeah. And I know I first heard this and I said, well, that sure makes sense. We're a gaming platform. Let's gamify. Let's give people goals. Let's give people things to blah, blah, blah. Okay. And of course, the key of gamifications is the game companies are hacking you. Yeah. And they know that you have this obsession of getting to the next level and getting the next thing, and that'll keep you playing, okay? In a game, pretty much anyone can get to level five or level six. It just takes time, right? Everyone's not going to be a 2000 ACCV streamer, mm. okay? And in fact, there's this double-edged sword because you say you want to motivate them. But as soon as you motivate them, if only 10 of 100 get it, they're now 90 are disappointed and frustrated and unhappy and feel like they've failed in some way. So interestingly, sometimes the way I do it is not by doing more. One of the ideas that many creators have said, oh, you should create levels on affiliate, right? That, you know, as you yeah. go up the stream and levels so that as opposed to just affiliate partner, you have a bunch of levels so that way I can keep striving for it. And I'm like, I don't, I think having... Things that are meaningful, that deliver meaningful value. Like, for example, when we did Partner Plus, yeah, right? That's something to strive for, that when you get it, you make more money. And that matters to you, okay? And so that's great. Creating an artificial one, games always create artificial ones. You don't actually get more money when you get to a level. It's just mm. like you feel better about yourself. Um, uh, I'm not as bullish on, because I feel like it's trying to keep them running the rat race, as opposed to realizing 
Why are they streaming? Well, they need to make money, but really they started it because they love what they're doing. Yeah. Right. And the impact they're having, and that can't be measured always because the impact, when I do a song and five people, you know, will go ahead and do, you know, their emotes and express how much they're appreciative of it. That's the connection that matters. I've seen platforms go very much the opposite way, like TikTok, where everything is so gamified. And you've previously said in your live stream to fill in, you care a lot about the torso creators. I mean, you mm -hmm. care about all creators. But I think the larger point is you don't just care about the biggest, the largest ones. Right. Because Twitch is a place around community. And I think what you're describing is this challenge of how do you measure and provide feedback on you're building a community or you're not. I remember at Instagram, when we built Instagram Live With, which was our version of Stream Together and Guest Stars, mm -hmm. I was the product mm -hmm. manager on that. And one of the inspirations behind it was because, hey, we have a lot of people who will go live and like three people are going to watch. And it's still meaningful. Like, guess what? When you're on a voice call with friends and maybe a couple of them join in, only two, three people are in that group call. No one's like, you only have three people in this right. live stream. You don't have a conversation with someone to say viewership concurrence in this conversation was two people. Yeah. It's still meaningful. That's why we built the product in the first place. To be like, oh, well, you can qualitatively come here and do it together. And, and yet, on a social platform, you're right. It becomes so hard. And it's how much reinforcement do you provide? At one point, Instagram considered hiding the number of likes and hearts that somebody would get. Again, yeah. in this ethos of if we give them too much, it'll make people nervous and burn out and focus on the wrong things. But that too wasn't good because people still care and they still freak out. Now, what do you think is Twitch's focus now? Not so much the metrics you're trying to move, but strategically, spiritually, what are the goals you're trying to improve and fix? So you highlight a few of them. One thing that I think the... Um, that we're investing a lot in and that I think are really valuable is increasing collaboration from streamers, mm. okay? Because um, streamers have two problems. First of all, they need to create content. And sitting there staring at a screen, talking to a screen is actually kind of hard. Yeah. Okay? And because you need to learn the emotional feedback, but, but whereas if I'm sitting and talking to someone else, it's much easier. Okay, if I play a song and you're on camera with me mm. um, and you applaud, then suddenly I feel good. Oh, they liked that song. Okay, um, pretty much outside of streaming, every traditional media platform, radio, TV, whenever you have a talk-based platform, it's almost never a single person talking, mm. when it, it, except for like a brief monologue, right? right? The late night talk shows, they all have a sidekick. Right. Um, uh, even um, Howard Stern has Robin. Mm -hmm. Right. And so collaboration, I think, will make it easier to create content. But equally important, um, as I said earlier, um, we keep people on the channel page on Twitch. Mm. The best way to grow on Twitch is collaboration with other streamers. Is the mission to, hey, people who are on Twitch, we're going to make your life easier. We're going to help support you more. Or is it to everybody should be a streamer? So this goes to this point about what is Twitch, mm -hmm. right? And um, I know I've thought a lot about this, so that everyone should stream. Um, and I like the idea that everyone should be able to create, mm. okay? Because we all have creative abilities. Mm -hmm. Creating a channel and building a following and building a community takes persistence. You can't do it I'm going to do it Tuesday this week and then I'm going to do it again in a month and then I'm going to do it in four months because that doesn't form a community. Now, you should still be able to express your creative ability on Twitch coming on someone else's stream, mm. right? Because the basis of UGC is the fact that everyone is a creator. How do we harness the creative ability of the masses? So I, do, I would like to find ways to harness everyone's creative ability. However, streaming on Twitch is about building a community and building a community is about some level of consistency, not necessarily 30 hours a week. Yeah. Okay. I make sure I stream at least once a week, right? And I work hard. Usually now I'm streaming twice a week or so, but, um, but I'm like, no, I'm going to stream every week because otherwise I can't form community. So yeah. I think it's a balance. Again, I think community, it, the virtual world, it is an evolution of relationship building in the personal world. It's not just about consistency. If you want to become friends with someone, it's not just about seeing them multiple times. 
there also is an element of intentionality. Mm -hmm. Hey, I actually want to build that deeper relationship with you. And Interestingly, yeah. that comes later in a relationship. Usually. Mm, initially, after you just see them a few times. Yeah, that in fact, the reason everybody, I mean, uh, now, there, there is a different type of intentionality. In fact, I had this Dr. K told me some of the science about this, which matched my intuition, um, which is having a shared purpose. Mm. Okay. Over time, you eventually say, oh, I really like this person. But it takes a while before you get intentional in that friendship. Or, and many times it just happens. You just wake up one day and say, wow, we're really good friends. I love that because so originally everyone we had on our podcast they were just people I was really good friends with already. And I was like, well, we'll just have a conversation and we'll just film it. And it evolved to, for example, when I saw you, you hadn't met me before. There still was this propinquity element from my side. I had seen you multiple times. Like I said, I've right. obviously following and I was like, why is he playing dodgeball? <laughs> it's like, wait, that's Dan Clancy and like a bandana seeing on stage, right? And as you said, there's intentionality for that shared purpose. Yes. Which is, I think your story is compelling and I want people to see and hear it. Right. But you're right. I think a lot of relationships build because you just see them over and over and it builds naturally. And then there becomes an intentional point of now it's time to deepen it. Yes. I think that too, because to my question, I said, should everyone be a streamer? And what I heard you describe in a way is, well, we're all creative. We're all born wanting to create. And I myself believe there's a world where creating becomes as easy as breathing. Like the technology improves in such a way that everyone's just living their life creating media, but no mm -hmm. one's sitting down and being like, I'm a streamer or an Instagram influencer because I think to be a streamer requires that additional opponent on community, which requires that consistency and that intentionality. So I could see everyone like making content and creating, but to be like a Twitch streamer requires a little bit more from you. Yes. I think this also ties a little to, you mentioned that you previously worked in AI. And what lowers the barriers of creation, which theoretically one day could make it easy for people to eventually develop that consistency and that intentionality is making it easier to make content. Now, one day, maybe AI is at a level where simple thoughts from people become artistic works in themselves. I'm curious your thoughts on this, especially because your predecessor as the CEO of Twitch has self-proclaimed himself as an AI doomer where I'm going to quote him, if you went to an AI and he said this publicly and you said, I want you to figure out how to build as many paper clips as possible. Step one might be destroy the world because that's what the AI decides is optimal to getting there. Yeah. How do you think about AI? So, um, uh, it's only with a PhD. I, so, so, so that your question has like 20 different pieces to yes. it. So I'm, since you came up with the AI doomer, I'm going to start with that one, but then we can go back to some of the other ones. Okay. So I am not an AI doomer. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I think this whole con, I, I think we, we grossly are underselling human intelligence when we talk about artificial general intelligence. Mm. Um, much of human intelligence isn't just about doing math or playing chess. And if you think about what happened with open AI, okay, think of all the different players and suppose they were AI bots as opposed to human beings. Right. Satya Nadella was building relationships, was forming bonds, was thinking about individual motivations. All the open AI employees that signed the letter, right? That was not just complex reasoning. They were going with their gut. They were going with their emotions. They were going, um, there's this one book um, uh, it says Social Why We're Wired to Connect by Matthew Lieberman. And it talks about how we have a big brain not to play chess. We have a big brain for human social interaction. And much of our brain is about human interaction. And so I think there are all sorts of parts of human intelligence, okay, that are not just about, you know, doing math. And so I think we are a long way. But even aside from that, let's take the doomers. I think the doomers have this idea that, A, this horrible thing is going to happen. I think they're just flat out wrong. Um, however, they also have this idea that for some reason they think they can sit around and come up with a solution to this hypothetical threat. Mm. And so um, uh, there may be a hundred things that can go bad with AI. Some bad things will happen with AI. I'm, ba bad things happen with every invention, right? The internal combustion engine is leading to global warming, right? Hard to get worse than that, okay? Bad things will come. 
Five of the hundred might lead to bad things. This idea that somebody now can not only predict which of the five out of a hundred things will happen, but can come up with an intervention that will stop it and that everyone will agree upon. Let's take social networking, something you know well. Bad things have come because of social networking and, and phones, right? You have teens in terms of depression and all sorts of things. In what world could somebody in 2008 have said, mm. I know what's going to happen with social networking and mobile phones. And not only that, I have a solution. We don't have a solution now, right? What about 1920s with the internal combustion engine and the industrial revolution? Someone said, ooh, 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 it's going to lead to global warming. Okay, and then they propose a solution. We can't propose a solution now to global warming. And we know exactly what's happening. So I think it's just fallacy that A, they can figure out what bad's going to happen, right? And B, that they can come up with an intervention. And I think they grossly exaggerate. But I think it gives them something, it gives them a microphone that they can speak into. And everyone loves to have something that someone else will repeat and yeah. play over and over again. This goes to your point on being confidence-based, motivation-based versus fear-based. It's easy to have something scary to point as the boogeyman that yeah. we have to be cautious yeah. of. Yeah, it's, do you, have you heard of Roko's Basilisk? No. So this is your point on how can we possibly know what could go wrong? Yeah. There's a group of AI thought folks who believe that you and I knowing and believing that AI could be a thing now puts us at risk at a time traveling AI coming back and killing us. And here's why. Because a perfectly optimal AI that's running the world better than we humans ever could do theoretically would realize it should focus all of its time on ensuring it comes into existence earlier, meaning it should go back in time and eliminate anyone who is not actively helping it come into existence. Meaning, if you are now aware that you could be helping the AI and you're not, you, like a basket looking at you and you freeze and turn to stone, you die, you are now a prey. It has been called a thought virus because if you never thought about this and you were blissfully unaware that you could be spending your time helping an AI, you're not at prey because the AI has no reason to target you. I heard this and my, my first thought was, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's it, another level of doomerism. It's another, and, and, and it's AI saying, look, AI might make decisions that are as bad as the woeful decisions that our leaders of today sometimes make. Yes. Right? And the reality is, uh, if you want to be worried about bad things happening in this world, there are lots of um, uh, decision makers right now that are making bad decisions that you can worry Let about. Let alone AI. Let alone AI. So I, I am not an AI doomer. Um, uh, I think it's. I, I think it, the the terrible things aren't going to happen, but it's just something for people to talk about, and people love to hear themselves talk. So then, as you said, even the open AI brouhaha, it came down to relationships. Yep. Where even if you can be really good at chess and math, it's building the connection community. We've just talked about it's about trust. It's about empathy. Yes. It's about and and we don't. Our brain, uh, uh, let me, uh, I've, I've written a blog post up at some point I need to publish this, but um, um, let's look at this room right now, okay? Suppose I'm not in this room and you were going to describe this room to me through a, a linear sequence of words, hmm. okay? Think about, you'd say there's a yeah, couch and you describe foot, this and, and all this. Then suppose suddenly I appeared in this room. I didn't know it's the one you described to me. Would I recognize it? Probably not. Mm. Right, I wouldn't recognize it because your linear sequence of words is not much of a representation of this room. The reality is it's just impoverished, okay? Because this room is three-dimensional, right? Now, suppose you did a painting of this room. Mm. It's still not the same as the room, but I might recognize the room, okay? I think the way we think, whenever we think, we think in words. Yes. Linear sequence of words. Now, we all know about our intuition, our gut, our all these other things. I think we think three-dimensionally. We live in a three-dimensional world. We, I think we, we use this word think and reason, okay? But often we come up to this decision. When you talk about the big decision in our lives, we use logic, but in the end, there's something in your gut that leads to that decision. And I think that is the way our brain works and, it, and it, it, it doesn't reason, but it incorporates other people, relationships, all these things. And the linear sequence of thoughts that you put into words is about as affected as a linear description of this room. It's just a very limited projection of a three-dimensional thought that you have. 
I 100% agree with this. I actually mm-hmm. got in an argument with Dr. K on this exact point. I believe, and there's scientific literature support that majority, if not potentially all of our conscious decision are in fact driven by our unconscious. Our system one brain. Yes. Thinking fast and slow. Yes. Yeah. Different yeah. systems. There's a very quick lizard brain impulse. Yep. And there's this deep moving, thoughtful, unconscious mechanics where we make a decision and we, as you said, come up with explanations why that may yeah. or may not even be accurate. In the same way we talked a lot about metrics being imperfect measures of what really matters, words and descriptors might not truly be why we did something, which also applies directly to AI. Large language models probably predict and replicate the output, the words of what yes, we're saying. It's just the words. They're chaining words together. But is there that underlying unconscious mechanical workings, conceptual no, workings? There isn't. And from my understanding, that's why you think the relationships piece will never be there. Because to build a real relationship, there has to be that trust. And I don't know what never means. I mean, we are light years away from it. I, I cannot, like this idea that I can predict what's going to happen in a thousand years. Yeah. I have no idea. But like right now, we are like a gazillion miles away from that. So understanding why you don't think AI captures the unconscious movements behind what we do. You said you're not a doomer. How do you think about AI, having worked on it for your PhD yeah. at NASA and in a position where, to my previous point, maybe AI helps with content creation? Yeah. So that that was the point you started on, this idea yeah. that um, uh, you can throw a seed out and something gets created. Okay. Um, you know, first, so I'll, I'll use an example of, of um, what I did. Actually, I um, uh, threw a seed out to chat GPT to write lyrics to a song about me getting denied partnership, <laughs> right? And it came up with a, with a mildly amusing song, right? Now, I don't consider what I did in throwing that out actually creating, mm. okay? Um, now, I could see taking that and then massaging it and twisting it. And ex- ex- so I do think AI absolutely can be a tool to help people create, especially in the dimensions of creation that they're weaker in. Mm. Right. We think of creation as a linear thing, but actually there are many, many dimensions of creative expression. Mm -hmm. Okay, And so you might really good be good with melody, but you aren't as good with lyrics. So you might use AI to help you to get some lyrics and then you create the melody. Okay, Um, I think it does help people create. I think on Twitch it will be very interesting because, you know, I think it'll give people things to react to. You know, I, I've thrown out this idea of suppose I have a a good angel and a bad angel on my shoulder, and when I'm streaming, I have the two of them have a debate, or I talk to one of them. Right? I think there are a lot of fun things that will happen that'll be entertaining. Um, and it's you, you said this one point that I think is so important: um, the found the foundation of user generated content is the combination of making it easier to create while greatly expanding who can use their creative ability. And I've I've often pointed out that, um, of course, YouTube um, uh, did this to traditional TV, where um, the number of people that could create a 30-minute sitcom for TV was a small number. The number of people that can create a five-minute entertaining video, far more people. But to create a five or 10 minute entertaining video still takes a fair amount of effort and talent. Right. And then TikTok went a step further and made it so that you can create a 30 second video. And the number of people that can create an interesting 30 second video is probably two orders of magnitude of the number of people that can create an entertaining five minute video on YouTube. Mm. And so basically TikTok did to YouTube what YouTube did to traditional media. And what they did was they expanded who can use their creative abilities by one to two orders of magnitude. And so that is the world of UGC, making it easier for more people to create. So what I really love there, though, is Twitch is an extreme on the other side. You said TikTok made YouTube easier. YouTube made television easier. So how does Twitch sit in this world, I think, though? So, so Twitch is another... I mean. Twitch came to be because of video cameras, inexpensive video cameras and inexpensive streaming, right? And then that allowed people to create. Whereas previously, if you wanted to do a live TV show, how much did you spend, right? The the metric I sometimes think of is, think of an hour of live entertainment. 
Yeah. Now think of the number of human hours that go into create it. So when I stream, if I stream for three hours, it probably took about three hours and 20 minutes of human energy for that stream because I don't do a lot of planning. Okay. Now, some of our big streamers, they have an assistant or three other people that are doing this, right? You're creating this and you've got folks that'll help you edit. How many hours went into creating a, a, a Saturday Night Live? Orders of magnitude. Thousands of human hours go into create one hour of Saturday Night Live. So think of that ratio. And what happened with Twitch is <clears throat> it allowed that ratio to come down to 1.2. Two, 2.3 versus a thousand hours for yeah. one hour of entertainment. Okay. It's a different medium of expression than YouTube or TikTok. Okay. But it, it was benefited from the same thing. And for me, the question I've often asked is what is that thing that makes it that much easier so that many more people can do it? And I don't know what that thing is. But I love it because you're right. YouTube, a television program. Hey, I go on to Nickelodeon, I go on to AMC. Here's the version of that. What you're describing, like radio broadcasts, traditionally news anchors, Walter Cronkite, good night and good luck, had the trust of the American public because it was the closest thing we had to synchronous live conversations at scale. And Twitch is the easier version of that where, as you said, the majority of hours spent can just be spent on creating versus the production distribution. Yep. It reminds me, I recently had a podcast with March, who's the podcast producer for Fear And with Will Neff and Hassan and Cutie mm -hmm. Cinderella and Austin. And he said their production is intentionally scuffed yeah. where you watch their podcast, the cameras aren't set up perfectly, the audio might not be right. The very first video, if you go to Fear And's channel, it's five minutes of Will Neff saying, welcome to the show. And Hassan going, give me a few seconds. I'm still ordering my food. And that has done so much better than what March told me. He used to produce a podcast with 100 Thieves that had 15 more layers of people. And the scuffed version has been so much more successful. After one of our announcements, I says, oh, well, after we do an announcement, I should live stream and answer questions, right? And at first, everyone was like, oh, well, okay, well, and, and where will you be? And who's going to be supporting you? I said, well, I'll just do it from my home. I'll just stream from my home and, and I'll just like go live. Just give me the pass key. Give me the stream key and I'll just go live. And it was like, oh, um, hmm. Oh, okay. And, you know, now that I stream regularly and now, now it's, but even for Twitch, it was like, well, we have to produce it. Yeah. Right. And I think there's an authenticity when you don't overproduce it. And in fact, one of the mistakes that, when I, I, I went on um, uh, Nick Cannon's um, sh sh you know, show, and one of the things I told him is I said, well, look, what you're doing right now is you're taking this kind of traditional format. And I said, you need to make it even simpler. You can do this from your house. Wow. You can do this like you don't lower the production value because that isn't what people are coming for. They're coming for the authenticity. And so it's this ethos around, as you said, you took some ideas put into ChatGPT. Give me a song of how I was rejected from Twitch. He said there was a seed. He said the seed necess didn't necessarily have that much creativity. ChatGPT didn't necessarily create for you, but it was a helpful tool because anything that lowers the barriers gets more people to get in content out there and then they can develop that consistency, that intentionality. And you're doing it now literally at Twitch in corporate communication. You're just like, how about announcing this by me talking to the camera and right. being like, hey, we should do this. Yeah. This is literally what interested me in the first place because the only other person I can think of like even does this kind of is Jack Conti. Nobody else. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't just turn on his camera and be like, hey, guys. I, now, I think there's a good reason for that. Mm, why? Okay, I don't think they're wrong in that decision. Mm. Okay. Um, very few um, uh, products will you use the product because you like the CEO. Nobody uses Amazon because they like Jeff Bezos. Okay, they use Amazon because they get their product shipped to their doorstep fast. Okay, um, now you might stop using a product because you dislike the CEO. Okay, and of course there are people who now have stopped using um, Twitter or X yeah, of Elon. because they dislike Elon. Um, Elon being outspoken, and Elon's very outspoken, um, uh, it doesn't help Twitter. Mm. Okay, um, Twitch is unique. 
Okay. Because for us, we have such a close knit streamer community. Okay. And it is the fact that me being out front matters a ton to them, a ton. Okay. I don't think that matters to the YouTube creators. Right. Because okay. they, I post it and I let it sit and it gets views. YouTube is their platform and yeah. they don't, and you know, who knows who the CEO of TikTok is? They remember it from one congressional hearing. Yeah. And if not for that, nobody would have any idea who the CEO of TikTok wow. is and they wouldn't care. And so him being out front and taking a risk of saying something wrong, right? Because if you say a hundred things, you're going to say something wrong. Always. And then someone's going to come and twist it. And if you're big... And so it's it's a ratio of upside downside, and I think with mm. Twitch there's huge upside because Twitch is about community. Twitch, yes. it's okay to be scuffed when you're live. There will always be things that are going wrong, and that's part of the beauty. So for you to do and build your own community reinforces to everyone, hey, you can do this too. Yes. Whereas if I were CEO of Amazon, I think it'd be stupid for me to do this because I would every time I would live stream, I'd be taking a risk that I say something that someone will twist. And, and like means something else. And, you, you know, it's funny when, you know, when I first started doing Dexter Toe would write articles about the strangest things. And now they're just bored by me. Like they hardly, <laughs> they seldom have any, they, they, because it's like, okay, yeah, because I do it Dan's enough. Dan's talking about whatever Okay, today. whatever. I, I, now we have to go find Maybe something else. Dexter, uh, Dan talks about Dexter Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, yeah, but so I don't think the other companies are wrong. Because I don't think it matters to them. Okay. Twitch is a live streaming platform. So there's a story in my head, though. Yes, part of it, there's clear business logic for why you want to represent <laughs> yourself as a human being. There's a story, though. There's also that artistic element in you where you enjoy it. Yeah. The relationships being heard and seen. Yep. You mentioned before that one of the hard things is when people are getting started, helping them feel, just because they didn't reach a lot of people, it was still a meaningful stream. I was thinking about this. In the real world, this is different. If I go and take out my guitar and start playing and I'm in a small cafe and there's five people there, it still feels great. Mm -hmm. But if I go online, I see five concurrents. I'm like, oh, wow, I really suck. Yeah. How does it feel someone who's saying online multiple times on string, and I assume in real life as well, what, what is the feeling different? How does it feel like? Whenever you do something, not just create, you want to have this sense of impact, mm. right? Um, uh, and that's why if you're giving a speech, you look in the front row to see if people are nodding and smiling and doing all that. Um, uh, and when you, you know, perform live, you want to see them light up and smile and yeah. like, you know, you want to matter to them. Interestingly, if, I, if I'm performing live and it's at a cafe and nobody's paying attention to me because they're all eating and having their conversations, right? That it's kind of like a job. Yeah. Like my daughter, who's a singer songwriter, um, uh, she doesn't love to like perform if it's a cafe where everyone's eating. Cause then she's just doing a job because nobody's looking at her and saying, Oh, I love that song. Yeah. Right. And in some ways online and Twitch is better because everyone is paying attention to me. Yeah. Everyone's literally tuned in to right. As opposed you. to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Honey, honey, honey. What, what's that music in the background? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The thing is you have to find the way to realize you're having an impact on them because you're right. If the number five doesn't tell you anything, if right. they don't say anything in chat, if that's where emotes come in mm. are so important. If they don't respond in chat, I don't feel like I had an impact. Yeah. Right. I need to see it because otherwise they just see a number five or 20 or 200 or it 800. Much. It doesn't mean anything because there's no physiological sense of... I had an impact, but then if they if chat's moving, you know, then you're like, oh, okay, you know, they they care that I did this. I've heard YouTubers say, you know, after my first million followers, one million, mm -hmm. five million, ten million, I felt good for a moment, and then it disappeared. Yeah, it's ironic that with technology, we're almost trying to replicate that human closeness that we lost with technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a quote from E.O. Wilson who said that. We have prim primitive brains with medieval institutions wrapped in godlike technology. Yep. And in a way, a lot of these technologies bring us further apart. Twitch, you're trying to bring them closer together. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that is, that's why I think Twitch is so unique in today's technological world because, in some ways, our um, uh, you know the the sitting and swiping causes us to be more isolated. Do you remember the first time you performed in front of someone? 
<laughs> um, I would have. I, I did not. I'm, well, let's say recently, because I performed when I was in high school, because I did theater. Oh, right. Okay. So I did theater well, in high school, that and it counts. I, yeah. yeah, but but that's so long ago, right? Yeah. And then I probably it was probably two 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 years ago that I started like playing the piano and singing. It was probably at an open mic in Truckee at the Alibi would be my guess. What got you to start again after so long? Um, uh, so, well, and I didn't sing and play the piano when I was in high school. I, I would do theater and I'd yeah, act. Different. Different. Um, I had always played the piano and I'd sing at the house and my daughter was a singer songwriter and she would go to open mics. And then I just like decided to do it one day. There wasn't any one thing. And, and then I'd go to open mics and every now and then I'd perform with my daughter. And, um, uh, and then, but the thing about Twitch, which I've, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, I would, I would look forward to an open mic where I get to do three songs and I'd show up and I'd put my name in. Sometimes I'd lug my piano there because a lot of times I don't have a piano. Um, and now I'm kind of like, well, I could go to the open mic and it's really nice or I can, and, and there'll be 20 people there that'll like it and I'll get to play three songs or I can stream on Twitch for three hours and at any given point in time, I'll have 200 people. And over the course of the evening, I'll have 2,000 or 3,000 wow. people listening. And I'm like, huh, this streaming on Twitch is pretty good. You're getting that human meaningful interaction now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It goes back to your point to you on the conscious. You said you tended your daughter's open mics. And one day, something in you, you're like, I want to do this. Yeah. Dan, thanks so much for making time today. All right. How are you feeling? I feel great. Uh, we covered... We covered a lot. <laughs> yep, yeah, we jumped all over the place, which yeah. is, makes it good, hopefully. I hope folks enjoyed it. For those of you who want to learn more and follow you, where should they go check out? So um, let's see, on Twitch, I'm DJ Clancy. So mm. DJ Clancy, nice and simple on Twitch, okay? And no, I am not a DJ. Those are my initials, okay? People see DJ Clancy and I sing and play the piano, but I mostly now, in fact, spend a lot of time talking to streamers and I started to game some on some of the streams. I did... Um, uh, GTA role play. I yeah. did um, uh, VR chat. Um, so on Twitch, it's DJ Clancy, but then on all the other social media, it's DJ Clancy 999. <laughs> because why 999? Because when back in 2000 or 1998, when I first started making accounts, and you'd have a username and you wouldn't use your email as your username, you'd create a unique yeah. username. And of course, you, you, with one, you couldn't get the same name, okay? And so I quickly realized I should do DJ Clancy 999 because I could get it anywhere I go. So when I first Jeez. created my Twitter account 12 years ago, and my YouTube account, I just created them DJ Clancy 999. So funny. Um, and that way, it's the same thing everywhere. So that's, and because, you know, if I did DJ Clancy 005, on some platform, it'll be taken. Yeah. Whereas 999, nobody, I've never run into someone having taken DJ Clancy 999. I love that. Well, DJ Clancy yeah. 999, thank you so much. And that's a wrap. All right.